Hello, my name is Rabbi Richard Bernholtz, and on behalf of Tampa Outreach, it is my pleasure to present to you a program on Yom HaShoah, which is a commemoration, remembrance of the Holocaust that occurred in Europe during World War II. With me here in the studio are two Holocaust survivors. One is Manny Reba, and the other is Henry Zindorf. And you will hear from both of them in just a second. All of us know, of course, from the historic record that in World War II, at least six million Jews were taken from their communities, and they perished, many of them, in the concentration camps. Others, as you will hear, perished along the way in work camps as they were being marched. And each year, the Jewish community worldwide, and especially in Israel, comes together to remember those who have lost their lives. This was established as a national holiday in Israel in 1959 as a result of a law that was written and signed by the then Prime Minister uh, Ben-Gurion. And it is set for, on the Hebrew calendar, the 27th day of the month of Nisan. This year, that will occur, Yom HaShoah, actually on a Friday, but because the Jewish community is getting ready to celebrate Shabbat, the actual commemoration of Yom HaShoah has been pushed to either Wednesday or Thursday evenings, and here in Tampa, it will occur on Wednesday evening, April the 30th. During this period of time, we wish to hear from Holocaust survivors like Manny and Henry who lived through this. And it is so important because we live in an era of Holocaust deniers, those who constantly say that the Holocaust didn't happen. And as more and more of our survivors pass on, it is very important for us not only to have their written record, their visual record, but also to hear from them as well and have their stories preserved. And so that's what I'd like to do. And gentlemen, thank you for being here with us. And I'd like to ask you a series of questions that will, I think, give us a good idea of what happened during that time, what your memories are, and what lessons that you have learned, and what stories and lessons you would like others to learn from it so that it does not happen again. I'd like to begin by first asking the question, did you see the Holocaust coming? Did you see the Nazis? Did you understand what they were doing? 
Did you fear for your lives? Or did you think to yourself, this, this couldn't happen to us, because surely you, you heard that Hitler had come to power? Henry, what, 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 what is your feeling? Was your family afraid? Did you think you would be arrested? We were very afraid, because even before the war broke out, there was a lot of, a lot of resentment against Jews, like a Jewish if you had a Jewish business, said you had to have a sign on it that you are a Jewish businessman in the name of your business. Sarah or Abraham, whatever, was on the sign. And anything, they start spitting on you and not let you on the sidewalks. No such a thing. They just push you around all over. And we knew it was something was coming. And then then it really happened when the Germans came in. And this was uh, on the 1st of, what was it, Sep September. Okay. Manny, were you fearful? Were you or your family fearful? Did you anticipate this? We uh, were uh, very uh, unpredictable. We didn't know what's going to come. But my family did not believe that something like that could come because we were respectable families in the community contributing to the, uh, to the economy. And uh, my father said, it, no, not, nothing can happen to him because we are we're very important for the, uh, for the community. Okay. You were connected. We are connected. Mm -hmm. so whatever came in, we know that it's dangerous, something is happening. But we did not accept it, the horror that the, that the cure. Now, everyone in your family, though, Manny, didn't believe that, if, as I remember. Uh, some of your family members, I think... My, my, fa my mother's brother did not believe, and they wanted to uh, run, actually run it by the war to Russia. And an uncle came in, and we all, uh, the boys, got on the wagon, and we went with uncle. My father and his sisters, I had uh, four sisters, did not believe that this is going to happen in their state with father and did not leave the house. Okay, and you obviously turned back at some point and they, came back home. We got in into a town called Stubnitz in Poland that's not far from the Russian border. And the, the German army came in reverse when they went through to the thing in reverse. And they shot up. There was still Polish army. There were still soldiers. And they came down and burned everything and ruined everything. We had nothing left. They lo we lost the horses. We lost whatever we had. And then we had no other way but head back. He came back home. Well, Henry, if you were fearful, you and your family, why didn't you try to get out at that time? Because we were in business. And all, all the family of ours were business people, and we never believed it. We said, God will help us. God will help us. It's going to be okay. It's going to be like the First World War. Uh, we, I didn't know about it, what it was, the First World War. But they thought it's not going to be so bad. So we were being and sticking around and, and trying to, to be in place. But it didn't happen like this. So what actually did happen to you? When were you arrested? Where were you arrested? And, and what happened after the arrest? I was arrested and sent to Freivaldau, to a labor camp. And then, there I had to work in a Dachziegel factory. In a shingle factory. Shingle factory, mm -hmm. yes. And we were working, working hard. We had to pick the, the, the clay to make the shingles and everything else. And we were sweating and working hard. And, and if the people couldn't work, they sent them away to another camp just to get rid of them. And so, what, what happened to the rest of your family? Did they go with you to the labor no, camp? No, they didn't. My father was uh, picked up about six months before I went to the camp. And he was taken away and never saw him anymore because he was sent to Auschwitz. Wow. And then my mother and my sister and brother were still home, and they, they made a, in Schrodler, outside Sostovitz, they made a, a ghetto. 
So they had to all go to the ghetto, out from the houses, and they sent to Schroeder. And then, then I heard when they sent him, I was notified from my uncles and so that they were sending him away to the camp. Did you see them again? No. Never saw them again? No. Okay. And then no. did you stay in that same labor camp, that concentration labor camp, making shingles, or did you move from there? From there they moved us to the, to the concentration camp to, uh, to uh, Kittlitz Traben. Okay. This was a department. I had one department from Gross Rosen. This was Gross Rosen was a, lo a lot of different camps under Gross Rosen. And what did you do at that camp? At that camp we went in '44. Okay, and what did you do there? Well, over there I worked. They were making bunkers for ammunition with all the things for the for the Wehrmacht, for the German okay. army. So you were making bunkers that were in the forest for the Wehrmacht. So right. The, they could hide from the, the Allies. Yeah. Okay, and then what ha And what was life like in those labor camps? Labor camp, at 4 o'clock in the morning, we had to go out on the Pell Plots. And they were counting if nobody disappeared or whoever is alive or dead. And then by, by 7 o'clock, we had to be on the Baustelle, out to work. Out to work, okay. Right. And then we got... A, Got one meal in the morning and one meal in the evening. It wasn't much. It was uh, dry, dry gemisi, you know what? Uh, it's like dry vegetables. Yes. Okay. So so both morning what, and evening was dry vegetables? Right. Okay. That's, that's what they f fed us in a, a piece of bread a day. It probably was about six to seven ounces of bread. And did you had friends who were working with you there? What happened to them? No, they was they worked the same way, going okay. and coming. And when we came back to the camp in the evening, they had to listen to all to all the beatings you got from the coppers and other ones. They looked at you wrong, they hit you. So okay. you try to be alive and not to do anything, just to stay away. So that you wouldn't get hit or beaten. It wouldn't be that side. And were others killed in the work camps? Oh, if, if they was just sick, once you get sick, they'd send you away because they didn't need you anymore. And what camp did you go to from that camp? To Buchenwald. Okay. This was nine weeks. We, we, were, we, we started in February and we got to Buchenwald in eight, two weeks before the liberation. Okay. Let's stop with your story at Buchenwald, and I'd like to hear about Manny and his family, how they were arrested, what happened to them, and then we'll pick up with the actual concentration camp stories after that. So, Manny, what happened to you? Well, we lived in a nice town. It was all industrial, industrial and productive, and my father was uh, in the meat business. And he had a lot of land we held, we, and we had a nice, very comfortable living. And uh, we had a house built, it's still there now. It was sitting on 60 acres of land that is in my, father, in my father's name. And when the Germans came in, and uh, I was in the same, at that day, I was in the same town what uh, where Henry was born. Yes. I had two relatives that were just 80 or 75 miles away. And both were in Poland. Both, yes. yes. And when the war broke out in the afternoon, I see that in that part that was Silesia, that the German really taken over the world. I had a bicycle. And I took the bicycle and I drove that bicycle for a whole day till I came back the following day to the little town where I came from. On the way in, I see people going in both directions. They were in one little town. They got in and they said, the Germans are coming. They're going to kill the woman. So they called to go west. On the west side, they went in and they sent the woman to go east. And they were crossing on the route. And I was mm -hmm. running with the bicycle. We saw a plane coming out, going down about 2,000, 2,000 feet with the machine gun. And it just creating chaos. But I got home. We settled down, and it, 
everything cooled off the Germans and about uh, two, three weeks later they came in a German command that they called him a commissar, there's an overseer in town. Mm -hmm. They came in and they took out, they took over a house and they set up. Then they came out and they start to get organized. So they got the organ, they, they, they start to establish a Jewish uh, a communication between, so they called out the rabbi, and they put him in the middle of the, ring, in the, middle of the, of the city, and uh, they took and they sh shot him. And, uh, and why did they shoot the rabbi in the middle? Just enough to establish the authority. Ah, to scare... To scare the people, scare the, to say okay. that, 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 that's the, that was the system, that they got one, two, three, and every time, wherever they came in, they had different... Some places they hung a few people, sometimes they... In our town, they came out and they shot the rabbi. Okay. Uh, and from there on, the community, and about the two, more, two, three months, they start to create work, work, workstations, clean up the roads and whatever it is. So the, the Jewish uh, uh, the uh, council. council had to supply them to people to go to work. We were, we had a lot of land, and my father was the thing, I got a friend with that German commissar. I was established with a friend of mine. He wanted to have, ten, we opened up a, a tannery to tend to process for him. Yes. So I did not go for about six months to those labor camps. But this, and, and then when this ended, they started to send us, we sent to Krakow to, uh, to clean up the Whistler, to build up on the Whistler. We were, uh, I was there a couple, two, three weeks, I ran away back home. I came home back and forth till 42, when one day they came in and they, started, they, they surrounded the city and uh, they got everybody to come out into the uh, into the, into the middle marketplace, and they said all people who, all the people, or pe women or with, with small children, they, they will provide them with transportation. So the, everybody got out on those horse and buggies that take them out behind the cemetery, and they shot a time about 600 people. Wow. The, rest of, the rest of us, they put us out, and they put from, from Jalashitz. That was your city. Mm -hmm. From Miahu, that is about six, six, 15, 16 miles away, kilometers away. They brought all these they people together. They brought all the Jews together there. Okay. And at that time, they came down and they brought out, a, a, there used to be a Arbeitslager in, in, in concentration lager, people that went to commandos to work. Yes. They came and picked people. And they picked, I don't know how many of us, they picked us, put us on the train, and they sent us to Plasho. Which is a different city. That different mm -hmm. city. And they took us out and put out. And then Miller came down and he said, whoever got gold or valuables to give it out. So nobody moved. So he took out three, four people from the, from the group and he shot him right, right in front of everybody to scare. So some people started to open up and had a ring or whatever it is. Okay, and so from that point, you went on to, uh, to various labor camps, right? We went to various labor camps. Tell us just a little about each one and what you did in each okay, camp. When we started out, we were in Plasio. We worked for a company called Fisher. Mm -hmm. We were building bridges, bridges on the way from, to the Russian front. And uh, we were under, under Fisher. I was always uh, in construction. I was yes. there with my father. Okay. When that thing finished, they took us up in Krakow. They called it Jugendlager. That's the that's the KZ, and they held us for about two weeks, till they came a request for other people, and they sent us to Skarzyska. Skarzyska was a munition factory called uh, Hasak, a German under a German coming Hasak. Okay, and so, the, in a sense, you were kind of like a labor pool. Labor, we were they would labor, hold you we in different places, and then they would move you the to one. wherever you went, very much like Schindler and Schindler's List would go take 
people, Jews from a labor pool, labor and they would pool, work yeah. in his factory. So now you ended up making munitions, I think, underwater mines? I worked, I worked on, on the Pickreen, a chemical called Pickreen. I don't know how they call it in English, but in German it's called Pickreen. That's the chemical. The chemical. And what did it do to you? That to you, we became all ankle swell up, and we were glowing at night. And the majority, glowing? You're uh, glowing? Glowing, yeah. We worked at night, we glow. You could feel your, your shadow was shining. And one day we got out, and they said people couldn't, were not productive. When we uh, made those mines, and the people were not careful, those mines exploded. And the more explosion we got that cost, that took that gang out, that took us out in the, in the woods. The, that camp was in a lot of woods. And there was a ditch in the shadow zone. I was so, shot in the side, and I lost my two teeth, and I fell with the grave. So they shot, they, they shot everyone, Everybody. they were all, because you were sick from the chemical. Well, we, the, whole, the whole group, they, we You're had right. no other way. They took us all out, and und we had to undress. And then they shot, they shot everybody. And in your case, you said they I shot got, you I through got the here. Wound, the, the wound got in the, under my jaw and under the tongue. And got knocked my two front teeth out of my teeth. Okay, and did you, clearly you didn't I, die. I did not. I did not die. I woke up. I don't know who was, and I was full of blood. I know how to get. I've been around there. I know how to get down a hall, and I got back into the barracks. I washed up, and I got back to my bed. And two friends of mine gave me one gave me a pair of pants, one gave me a jacket, and next morning I went back to work. Wow, that saved your life. Yes. Wow. And where did you end up going then from when, the munitions camp? When the munitions camp was to an end, I don't either. The Russian army got close, they started moving us. They moved us to Chenstachau. And in Chenstachau, there was also an ammunition factory, but I was placed, my father was in the ammunition factory, about a, a mile apart. So your father was put in one camp, you were and put in another. I was put in another. in another camp. I worked in a um, steel mill, where I'm making melting steel. And from there, they put in uh, November of 40, uh, November of 44, about October, November of 44, when the Russians came in, they pulled us all out, and the, the, the sicker people they shot, mm -hmm. and whatever, whoever, the healthy one, gave us a, a slice of bread with margarine and put us in the railroad cars. Okay. And in the railroad cars, we were all night, the Russians were already in town. But they managed to hook us up, and we were for four days in those railroad cars without food, without opening. And we had people die. We had to have a, a sanitation. So we used to take the two corners of the building. We decided sure. that we laid out corpses and mm -hmm. behind the curtain. We used sure. that as a And sanitation. the Russians did this to you? No. No, that's, the Germans. That's the, that was still the Germans. I still arrived in, I arrived in Buchenwald okay. in November of '44. In the way I was, we were there about four or five weeks. They were bombarding Weimar. They took us. I volunteered to go to right. Weimar. Right. Then they came on order that they needed to another ammunition and electronic. My father planned any people. So from there I went to Kolditz. Okay, but before we go there, what happened to your father? He was in a different camp. We were we, in Buchenwald. We met again together. We got back together. Okay. And we were together, but they, they were distinguished younger people, more, more, more distinguished people they can use for different purposes. They put my father in, in a more higher caliber work than they put me. Uh -huh. okay. So he went to Kolditz, to Treglitz, and I went to Kolditz. Okay, so my, you, you went to two different camps Two different then. camps. My father managed twice through a German to send me a message. Through I a got, German? Through okay. a German. I got two messages through a German. And from there on, when the Russians came in into Treglitz, they made us walk to Theresienstadt. So we walked into Theresienstadt. And on April the 12th was a big cold day, snow, very cold. And somebody, somebody told me that my father got a, a cold or whatever it is. And they shot my father in Marine, in, in Marine Bad in Czechoslovakia. And some years on the roadside, they were buried in. Wow. I wound up, I found out four days later in the Stadt that, that I lost my father. Wow. 
Now, you and Henry ended up in Buchenwald at the same time. No, not, not at, the, at same, the same time. Not at the same time. We oh. were at different times. Okay, well, let me ask Henry now, what happened in Buchenwald when we, you were there? We came into Buchenwald, was like two weeks before we were liberated. We were liberated April the 11th, and it was like 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Patton came drive through, and then... Uh, Eisenhower was a couple days later came into the camp and when they came to the camp the dead were piled up on on high high mountains with all the deaths because they had only four ovens over there they didn't have enough to get rid of too many people right away right. and most of them were sick and after we came to Buchenwald and the Russians were behind them already pushing so they tried to move us out again from Buchenwald to, another, to go to another camp just to walk. And the people would have went out to walk because they were still strong enough to walk. So they went into the, to the forest and they were shot over there. So we found this out just a couple of days later. So once the Americans came in and... We tried to get some food or something, but the Americans brought in. They gave us goulash the first day, very rich, and this killed another at least 5,000 people after this. Just because they didn't so, realize no, no. that you can't give so much rich and, food to starving people. And then there was another thing. They poisoned the water in Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. So we had the Americans bringing in the tanks of water from Weimar. They were bringing in the, with the tanks. Wow. And what what did things look like in Buchenwald? How would you describe the It was such a big mess. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know it. To wash, we forget, forget about it. We didn't have where to go to wash, to do anything. It was, and if you get a piece of bread over there, if they gave you already a piece of bread, you had to finish it quick, take it in your mouth, otherwise it would be gone. What, what do you mean it would be gone? The people ripped, ripped it out from your hand. People were just like animals, okay. just grabbing it out. And um, how, did you, how, how did you survive all of this? You know, not everyone survived. No, to, no, to what no. do you attribute your survival? I don't know. You see, in the last camp, in Kittler's Thaben, okay, we walked hard, and we were always down, depressed and everything, but... The food wasn't too bad, even with the dark, with the, the dry gemis and all, and all the things, we got by somehow. But the people would come in from other camps, they were already, ready. just, they laid down in, on the floors, on the cement floors and died right there. They didn't even get up. And so, we were sleeping with the same people. And, well, so, are you saying that luck played a part? Luck, most is luck. Okay, but so you ended up in camps and work camps. You were healthy enough to work. You ended up in work camps where you got at least enough food to food be able to, get to survive. By, yes. And then the war, of course, ended. Right. And, and to what do you attribute your survival, Manny? What, do you think luck was a part of it? Alertness. Alertness? Caution. And a little luck. And a little luck. Okay. And um, what did you learn? You said that uh, people in the camps taught you survival techniques. What, what were some of those techniques? We, between our <clears throat> uh, um, prisoners, we tried to find out in camp. In 1943, we were in, in camp and a doctor came in. And he said, since they gave us a ration to carry the body, according to their thing, they, 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 their body needs so many calories. We didn't know that, and nobody understood that. He said, as long as you got a slice of bread, or whatever food you get, eat it, put it in your body, and your body will, will control your calories. And whoever practiced it had a better chance to, uh, to, to survive than those people who did not. What was the alternative? If you didn't put it, if you didn't eat everything they gave the, you right away, the, 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 what, what did the, the, some people the, the, do? The people were stealing. People were doing anything else. They, they were so desperate for food that they were uncontrollable. Uh, did some people take their ration 
cut it in yeah, half, that, pocket part of it so they could eat it later. Yeah, but people coming out with the idea that he got a sli they got a slice of bread in the morning. He had to have it in the morning, and he's going to have the other have it at lunch. But when it came down to lunch, he didn't have the, the slice of bread when it came to supper. Because he someone lost, else had taken it. Somebody else had taken it. He lost his life. Wow. What happened at Liberation? Uh, how did it happen? What happened? And, and what did you do after your camp was liberated? Henry? You see, we were liberated on a Wednesday afternoon in, in Buchenwald. Yes. So once we were liberated, the people who were still a little stronger tried to get out of the camp and go out to Weimar. And so that, was that a, a nearby town? Oh, yeah. It's mm -hmm. only five kilometers away. Okay. This was the Weimar is with the tearing in the, like the capital. So we walked there with clothes, without clothes, just to get out. Mm -hmm. And he came in, maybe you got a little water or something, if you could pick up from the Germans or something. But they, they weren't so generous. They didn't let you grab anything, but you, if you could, you grabbed it. But that's the way you got back. And then the next day, the Americans brought in like gulash. And the gulash killed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They were just falling like flies mm -hmm. because it was too much for sure. them. Sure. So, and that's what it was. But after, uh, after a few days, they start bringing in dietitians to give us like uh, f uh, farina and other things, different foods, so start building up a little. But right. we, uh, anyhow, most of us got sick and typhoid and other things. So the stronger ones survived. The other ones just died. And did you remain in Weimar, or where did you go no, after that? No, I was. I remained there till the Americans handed over to the to the Russians the whole the whole camp the whole camp and the whole area. And but and what happened after that? After that, we had a choice to go. Where we could go home to Poland. We didn't because we knew that nobody was left over mm -hmm. there, and, or we can go to Switzerland or. Uh, not to America yet, but you could go to other places. So whoever want to go, then they left. You got trains going and buses going and everything taking us out. And where did you go? I I went from this camp. I went to to Bayern. I went to Bamberg. Mm -hmm. And what is it? It was a whole train going to to Germany over there to Bay to Bayern from this camp. So we had a group of about 15 people. So came just before Bamberg, uh, Schlüsselfeld, we got off the train, the train stopped, uh, and we, went, we, we walked into Bamberg. And then we went into the Bürgermeister, like the city, city yes. hall, and they gave us some rations for food. The mayor, yeah, gave right. you rations. So that, and then we settled there. And you, you lived there for a while? Oh, yeah, we mm -hmm. lived there, and we lived outside, outside Bamberg, it was Aschbach. Mm -hmm. There was one uh, one German, what, uh, they, he had a castle in Aschbach, and we could have taken the castle, so we take, took it over. But what is it? They put him on trial, and he wasn't a Nazi anyhow. So after, after the trial, they sent him back home, so we had to leave Aschbach. Okay. And I'll and pick we up your story after that. Manny, I know you have a very exciting story to tell about what happened at the... At the end, the release at the end. Yes. At the, at the end, a day before, we saw that the SS. We were at concentration camp in Theresienstadt. Yes. In Theresienstadt, that used to be a point where the Nazis always put in all the dignitaries. That this that it was a special camp, but toward the end, this was the salvage that they put us in there. And. At the day before, we saw that the SS men at the gate disappeared. They put out the Jewish police and put them there. In the afternoon, I we go in, in the early in the morning. I go down. It must have been five, six o'clock in the morning, and I go down and I hear rumbling. I I got to the there was a big wall with barbed wire mm -hmm. over the to the out from the camp. I jumped on the on the thing, and the the wire was already cut. Somebody before me went through and cut the wire. Uh -huh. And so I went out on the other side and I see Russians. And as about a quarter of a mile, I see a big field and there's German soldiers 
sitting in there by the prisoners of war. Prisoners of war. I got in, and I got in there. But I had nothing more interesting but food. So they all had rucksack bags. I took off the rucksack and I went out and I and I accumulated bread, a piece of salami, whatever I could. That I put one on the bag and I load up the three rags. And I said, I'm going to go back and bring to my friends something to eat. When I got back to the gate, there was, was a Jewish policeman. And he said, I was out. He let me in. I got in. And as I walked with those bags, they gave, the fat saw that I got food, they fell. They bruised my face. They grabbed, ate up the food. I got nothing. So I went up and I washed up. I lay down. I was, I was not hungry. So I lay down, have a little nap and sleep, and I got the three, four boys. I said, I was out there. I know who goes with me. So what the five more fe fellows with me, we all went out, jumped out the floor. They so walked. you left the... You, you left so the... Just the, jumped out and got out. Escaped. And mm -hmm. next, about uh, half a kilometer away, the, the, the Czech people put out and put up soup kitchens. And they gave us a bowl of hot soup. And the guy gave us, and he gave us a, sh a jacket, a shirt, and a pa pants, and a pa we had those striped things, and mm -hmm. we wanted to get rid of it, we didn't want to be identified with it. Sure. And then I went, and I saw the Russian soldiers driving. He said, you did sit down. But we, went on that, and, uh, we went on that tank, and we drove maybe an hour, they were going, uh, crawling so, maybe, yeah. uh, very slow. But we were about an hour, and we told them that, I said, what do you want to do? He said, we want to go home. So there was a captain. I don't know if he was Jewish, but he was very sympathetic to us, and we communicated. He took us down and gave us there were two horses and a wagon, and that wagon was just like a supply wagon. And they had them all. They didn't. They had them already separated. He gave me that supply wagon. He went to another wagon, whatever we saw food, and we start driving. I ate bread. My friend, they were pork, whatever they, they, over, they didn't realize, and they got the diarrhea. We got in as far as Bratislava. It was maybe a five, six hour drive with all this. We got sure. into Bratislava. We settled down for the night, and the guys just got sicker than sure. anything. We didn't sure. know what to do. And there's, there's a Czech, some two Czech people came over in their always, and they came down and they picked, the, they picked four of those fellows up and I never saw them anymore. Wow. We got the horses the following day we were side driving till we got to the Polish border. When we got to the Polish border, the Polish border guy came and said, Where are you going? I said, We're going home. Where you got the horse first they took us away the horses. They took away whatever we had accumulated. We managed to get two little two little packages with us. And with this, we went to the hometown. So after you were both freed, you found there were some people who were sympathetic and who were nice, and there are others who took whatever little but, you had. But they, were wicked. It, but they didn't stop mm -hmm. the police. Police took us everything away. And, but we managed to go back and get back to the hometown, to Jalashitze. Yes. And in that town was already a few people living there. And when we got into our town, there was no hotel. When somebody lived there, they weren't you. You got in right with him. That's what the style. Yeah. We never had to ask. We come down. We here. We. You you stayed with whoever. Stayed with them. We were we were there about five days. How did you each come to the United States? To the Jewish Joint. Okay. The Joint Distribution. Committee. Right. And, and when did you come, Henry? Uh, the end of '49 and okay. the end of September. Okay. And they helped get came you set Cleveland, up here to Cleveland. Right. And Manny. I had a different situation. I was in Israel. I was, I was part of the organization. So you went to that, Israel? For, I, mm -hmm. I was in Israel. In 48, when the United States of Israel, my wife had a sister. And, they, were, and they, she, they went to Israel, and we sent everything to Israel. We sent away equipment. And when they got down to Israel, uh, they, I wanted to see that they settled. And we got letters from them that they, they sent them in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Negev and in, in Kwan Shah. It's not the far from Ashkelon, mm -hmm. on a desert field. And they had rough life. So I said, I take my time. But we were, I was, I was uh, wheeling and dealing. I had a car. I bought, a, bought back a car. 
and I was down in Munich, and I drove by in Munich, and I see a big sign, I, you can register to go to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I was there with three more other guys in the car, and I said, I'll go, and I went in and registered. I got back home to my wife, and I said, Sally, I said, I registered to go to America. She said, good. She said, you go to America, I go to Israel, and I wave you halfway. <laughs> but whatever reason, within 30, 40 days, it went so fast. And uh, in the, in the, by December the 1st, I got to the relief to go to America. And I left, I left, I left on February, and on, no, and, this, and we left in January to Bergen, Bergen mm -hmm. but they kept us over there right. for three, four weeks. And I had a boy two and a half years old. And we arrived in, the, in New York on February the 1st, 1950. Wow. Couldn't speak a word of English. Um, very important question for both of you. After all that you have been through, and then surviving, what has this done for your faith? Has it strengthened your faith? Has it led you to question? Manny, what do you say? I, I, there's nothing that we cannot deny we were born Jewish. We have, we have a Jewish tradition, and we like to maintain Jewish. But we got to, you, we got to recognize humanitarian, you got, we got to recognize uh, the times that we're living in. And what do you mean by that? Uh, that all that the old the, tra the old tradition is out is out outmoded. Outmoded. Okay. And your faith in God? Huh? Your faith in God? I don't know. I could never talk to him. When I needed him, when I prayed, when I when I real woke God, I said there was. We couldn't make no contact. Okay. Henry, how about you? Yeah, I do the same thing. I still, till today, I still ask questions. What's going on? And the, the people, the Israelis, they were freed from Mitzrayim. But what happened to us? We didn't see no miracles by us. And still we believe in something, but really... Really be orthodox about it, I don't think so. We, we went through and for nothing. The kids were, not, were innocent for many things and they were thrown into the, the crematoriums. So I don't know what, what's the whole, but I still say the, the world has to change and not to have the hate for this religion or another religion. They so all should be equal even. They so all want to, to live and just be happy and just get by. And I don't know why it all happens today in, in Africa and all over. They still kill people for nothing and yeah. hate people for nothing. Genocide continues. We right. still, unfortunately, have right. a great deal of prejudice and bigotry. And, right. Oh. Uh, people use religion to uh, impose it upon others. And as a result, unfortunately, people, right. innocent people That's die. That's right. And it sounds to me like your faith, both of you, has been greatly shaken. And yet, I think that a statement of your faith can also be found in the fact that you continued on. You married, you you've had children, you continued to build your lives and to build your congregations. And I, I think it's that lesson of hope, maybe not always theoretical, but a practical one in which you put one foot in front of the other and keep going. It maybe is the lesson that we need to learn. Uh, be vigilant, always do everything you can to make the best of the situation you have, but at the same time never give up hope because sometimes you create your own luck. And another thing what it is, the people teach hate. That's the worst thing. Right. Well, thank you both for being here with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for the insights, for your honesty and sharing, and let's us all hope that in the years to come that indeed there will be peace and understanding and innocent people will perish no more. <music>